Two things draw me to Martha's poems over and over. First is the way her work is connected to that most ancient sensibility stemming from our sacred texts, that poetry is ethical and revelatory. Whether writing a contemporary book of hours, exploring an historical event, meditating on race, on whiteness, or documenting private grief, Collins achieves what Alice Fulton calls a poetics of justice and revelation. In tandem with this ancient impulse is an unerring instinct to be innovative, to find new shapes and containers for our ancient quests. She interrogates syntax, upends grammar, marries narration with fragmentation. Her poems enact a mind relentlessly attempting to know. And when I read her books, I feel as though I know better the full range of what poetry can do. Please welcome Martha Collins. Thank you, Kieran, Alfred, and the Newburyport Literary Festival. And thank you, Ernest Tilbert. I look forward to hearing you read. The title of our session is Public Poems and Private Songs. I'm going to begin with private songs, which come from my most recent book, Because What Else Could I Do? A sequence I addressed to my husband, Ted, in the months following his sudden death almost five years ago. These poems are so private that I hadn't intended to publish them at all but here they are. I should note that Ted and I had always commuted be between his home in Hartford and mine in Cambridge. The poems are untitled. I'll just pause between them. I alone in a restaurant and what is left of you at home in a plastic box on your dresser where you kept your socks and put your change. And what will I do at home in my own house? What will I do with my one spoon and my wide bed? What will I do without, without? I have to tell you I'm sleeping with a snowy owl, a kid's puppet my friend sent me. It has a stick so you can turn the head all the way around the way owls do, but I can't feel the stick. Her wings wrap partway around me and comfort me. I know she is a she because she has black spots. And I should also mention the photograph taken by another friend who gave it to me. It's sitting on my desk beside some pictures of you. It's a snowy owl and she is flying toward you. The next uh, four poems were written on Cape Cod where my husband's children, their families, and I went to scatter his ashes in December. The winding road, the bare trees, through bare trees, the gray pond, beside the pond, the bench where you sat, the empty bench, the still pond. Across the pond, the two white chairs, the chairs reflected where I would swim. And when I'd swum almost back in, you'd get in the water and meet me there. Paper bag with empty box with almost empty plastic bag and on my hands and on my jeans, you some part or parts of you from when we sent you into the sea, low tide, so you easily rode the lightest currents in tiny explosions of white. And when we finished a sudden late sun on the water of which you were becoming a part, on runnels between patches of sand, as if you were signing yourself in silver. In the dream, we disagreed. You've ordered twice as much fish as we need. And when I've complained, you've walked out of the store and left the fish. And I've walked out behind you and into the night in the little beige heels I wore in the picture I sent before we met. And you've gone to the car, but I haven't followed. I'm walking home and home is miles away in this town 
which isn't your town or mine, and now it is dark and there are no cars, no lights, and I am very afraid. I think I should not be walking alone and not in these shoes, but I am alone and home is twice as far from here as I ever thought it would be. Another beach, the last one we walked together, hand in hand in the August sun. And I walked on while you rested there, and now it is winter and I am here with almost the last of you in my hand, a tiny part of some parts of you, your hand, your blue eye, shoulder, mouth. And I try to gentle you into the sea, but a sudden wave rushes over my feet and the wind catches this part of some parts of you, and instead you are in the air and more than before you are on me. You have met me again. You will not let me let you go. You are in the sea where you wanted to be, but you are also in air and sand and earth where your grandson will bury another small part. And now I lick my finger and you are in me. And with you went my summer son, a friend or two, and who was there. And with you went the weeks to come, the months so far, so far, my one. My body too, the one I knew as one of two. Though you forgot to take desire, which now is wrapped in grief's long arms. And with you went the one I was, that was, within, without, with you, mostly brave and largely true. The one I find some moments in some darkened place of joy, then lose. And the last poem I'll read from this book is based on a series of hanging sculptures by the Colombian artist Doris Salcedo, one of which is reproduced on the cover of the book. Um, they're shirts made from sewing needles and silk thread, which makes them both threatening and beautiful. And they were created in honor of the many young men who had recently been killed in Chicago. I want to make you a morning shirt, a beautiful thing like the artist made for the murdered young men. But this would be for me, for us, with traces of lost thread by thread not to manage grief, but needle by needle inserted bra in the center of our lives to appear and disappear, the absent almost within, but not to touch. And now I'll turn to some more public poems. First, some earlier ones. I'd always written individual poems about political events and public events, but some years ago I discovered that my father had witnessed a lynching as a kid in Cairo, Illinois. That led me to begin doing research about the, the lynching and related issues, and the result was a book-length poem called Blue Front. As I was writing the book, I focused on my father, wondering what he would have experienced and how it would have affected him. But the more I wrote, the more I realized that I needed to explore my own life, which led to a collection of poems called White Papers. The book continues the kind of research I'd done for Blue Front, in this case exploring, among other things, the racial and racist history of places where I've lived, Iowa, California, New England. But it also contains more autobiographical writing than I'd ever done as it looks back to my childhood in a state that was 99.3% white as I was growing up. Once again, the poems are untitled, so I'll just pause between them. The first one of these I'll read takes us back to Africa, where all human life began, but it opens in Des Moines, Iowa, where I grew up, a city in which most of the streets were parallel and perpendicular, which made the map that appeared each year in the phone book look something like a grid. 
They lived in the colored section of town, as if the white pages map had been crayoned, little squares inside the lines, as if they too had been covered with color, something added to what was given, i.e. ourselves who did not know, not even our teachers, that they were the given, that we were the altar, that we, who still were they, there was no difference yet, lost our color, slowly erased it as we moved north where a distant sun could not get through. And on we went, making roads and maps of rivers and roads, assuming we owned it if we could draw it and color it in and give it a name. And still we are drawing lines and calling them borders and coloring in and naming people who shall not, must not cross who live in the colored sections of our white minds. Black keys from trees, white keys locked on black shoulders, locked together above skeleton ribs, keys to 45 keyboards from one tusk, the word ivory rang in the air, one tusk plus one slave to carry it, bought together. If slaves survived the long march, sold for spice or sugar plantations. If not, replaced by other slaves, five Africans died for each tusk, two million for 400,000 American pianos, including the one my grandmother played. Not to mention grieving villages burned, women, children left to die, the dead elephants whose tusks went to Connecticut where they were cut, bleached, and polished. While my grandmother played in Illinois, my mother played and I. There were many old pianos and slaves were used till the 20th century. An African slave could have carried a tusk that was cut into white keys I played, starting with middle C and going up and down. No Chinatown in my hometown, just missionary chopstick news. We knew that San Francisco had. We didn't know the gold rush brought them, maybe knew the transcontinental railroad brought. We didn't know when it was done, the act of 1882 excluded the women still were bought to, yes, until the war we knew when it wasn't China, it was Japan. This was years before I rode the train to a school near San Francisco built by one of the rich railroad men. My large class had a few Asian Americans. I knew one. This, the missing word in this next poem, as I think you'll soon see, is white. The Irish were not. The Germans were not, the Jews, Italians, Slavs, and others were not, or were not exactly or not quite at various times in American history. Before us, the Greeks themselves were not, though the weaker enemy Persians were. The next step, Romans themselves were not either. And later, the Europeans were not, until Linnaeus named by color red, white, yellow, and black. Even the English settlers were only vaguely at first to contrast with natives, but then with Africans, more and more of them slaves to be irreversibly totally different from they were. Then others were not, then were or were not, but gradually became leaving only for a time black and yellow to be not. Then there were other words for those who were still or newly see immigrant, Arab, somehow not the same and therefore not. Thus history leaves us nothing but not, like children playing at being something we made, we keep making our whiteness up. The last poem I'll read from this book seems even more relevant today than it did when I wrote it. Black people can turn white, see vitiligo. Black people can be white, see albino. 
white people can turn black. See miscegenation laws against. So they measured brain space, lined up skulls, invented a second creation for after the flood. So they measured test scores, not the test, told us we must reproduce, told them to go back home. Because black people could, brown people could, brown people could, yellow people could, brown people could, white people could disappear. Because people could. The last two poems I'll read are a little longer and more recent. I'd like to read both of them thinking of the police killings of George Floyd and Dante Wright, which have been so much in the news this past week, along with the even more recent killings of Micaiah Bryant and Andrew Brown Jr. There were way too many others before them, including the subject of this first poem, which goes all the way back to 1959. It's a response to an unfinished project begun by the late Jake Adam York, who wrote many poems honoring victims killed during the civil rights movement. He planned to honor them all, but died at the age of 39, leaving others of us to carry on. Following Jake's own rules, I prepared myself to write the poem by visiting the site of the murder, in this case, Philadelphia, Mississippi. Philadelphia, you'll recall, is where Cheney, Goodman, and Schwerner, the three civil rights workers, were imprisoned before they re were released to be brutally killed outside of town. The event described in the poem happened five years before that, but the same police officer was involved. The poem is in three short parts. Rehearsal, Philadelphia, Mississippi, Luther Jackson, 1932 to 1959. A block from the county courthouse with the Confederate soldier memorial, past the jail where the civil rights workers were held while the Klan assembled in 64. Down bird to oak to water to pine, past magnolias into sweet gum catalpas, into this dead end cave of trees where he parked one night with a girl and passed out and officer Rainey found them and ordered him out of the car and pushed him out of sight of the girl who heard two shots and heard Rainey say, come down, I think I have killed a. And then the coroner's jury said justifiable homicide. And Medgar Evers requested an investigation, but the Justice Department said no violation. And five years later, they accused Rainey and 20 others of conspiring to kill the civil rights workers. But three years later, Rainey himself was acquitted. And 50 years later, the FBI reopened the Jackson case, but found no police, no county records, just newspaper files and relative stories. And anyway, Rainey was dead. Of course I couldn't have been that girl, but if I'd been the white girl I was and lived here and read the papers, would I have questioned justifiable? And if I'd been here five years later and read about the civil rights workers and decades later when Michael, Eric, Tamir, Philando and all the others, could I? Can I imagine myself in that car at the end of this dead end street where a man was ordered out of the car and the girl who was with him, who was not me, cried, you have killed him for nothing. The last poem I'll read focuses somewhat more broadly on gun violence. The five-part structure is based very loosely on the biblical book of Lamentations, which, was in, which has five chapters. All the incidents mentioned are based on real events, including Trayvon Martin, who is the subject of the second section. Lamentations. One. America, more guns, more than us. Bullets, 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 more. Children in school, boy in park, no sorrow. Dead in her yard, 
his car, no sorrow like. X while being black, gone without. 2. February 2012. Ought to be a law against. We gotta stand up for justice. How many justices? One for you, and even if a witness, stand your ground. Stand, stood, should he have stayed in his? What kind of case is that? A brief case of life. What kind of ground that can't be walked on back from a store with candy? Something with un in it. Something to use to stand against a person of standing to un a boy of. Three, August 2019. El Paso, at least 20, a manifesto, Hispanic invasion, a mother shielding, now 22, her baby, the father, a 90-year-old. Dayton, at least nine, patrons inside and outside a bar, now 10, including the killer, had made a kill list. Midland, Odessa, at least five, shooting while driving. The killer had failed a background check, now eight. Four. Driving home from the grocery store with his girlfriend, facing the cop with his hands up, stop, don't shoot. A woman who'd been a man for being a woman. Blacks for being black, Muslims. Jews. A gang member shot by a gang member shot by a gang. A gang member raised in a high crime neighborhood. Suffered years of abuse, a restraining order. Woke with a gun pressed to the back of her neck. On her first day of school with her sister by her father. By her two-year-old who found the gun in her purse himself with a rented gun at a target practice, himself had lost his job, could not support. Himself, herself, themselves for being somewhere by someone, someone else, themselves, a gun. Five. Remember our people killed by guns. We have more guns than people. Remember our hundred people killed each day, the shot and injured. Remember our thousand killed each year by police, a quarter black. Remember our children and youth, a mother whose son. Remember, she said, they say, remember us. Thank you. Thank you, Martha. I mean, the, what you've done, you've made such a seamless transition between those private songs and the public poems. And, you know, because the loss that the private songs are born of, you know, connects connects all of us in the larger community. And then because we're all, that loss is inevitable. And then your experience of the larger world, you make it so immediate that it feels as though it just happened. I mean, it feels the same as, it feels so like private loss. It's just a wonderful reading. Thank you so much. Well, those of you who attended our opening event last night are already acquainted with our next reader, but I'm going to introduce him anyway. Ernest Hilbert's debut poetry collection, 60 Sonnets, published in 2009, was described by X.J. Kennedy as maybe the most arresting sequence we have had since John Berryman checked out of America. His second collection, All of You on the Good Earth, has been hailed as co containing some of the most elegant poems in American literature since the loss of Anthony Hecht. His third collection, Caligulan, 
was selected for the 2017 Poets Prize. And that's a, quite, a, quite a big prize. So he's won some praise. And I can tell you the praise is deserved. Opening a book by Ernest Hilbert is like walking into the home of a skilled carpenter. There is an immediate sense of craftsmanship, solidity. Things aren't about to fall apart here. But Hilbert writes about the world we live in where things often come undone in spectacular fashion. The tension between the well-made poem and the fractured world it evokes is only one of many tensions that charges work with dramatic energy. Hilbert's formal verses are like boxes of gunpowder fit to burst. My heart is a meteorite, he tells us. I am its crater. In his most recent book, Last One Out, even the poems of childhood offer imagery better suited to the battlefield than the playground. He writes of kids in broken boots whose dogs are leashed with frayed twine in scattered groups, like aimless parts of a convoy attacked from the air. This is childhood as a war zone to be evacuated at the center of the new collection is a poem titled Against the Art of War, in which Hilbert writes, war begins and builds in all things and supports his claim with an extraordinary list poem. It waits all summer in the young wasp tail on a tetanus bristling nail, he, he writes. He sees it in the crouch and pounce of household cat the loser's shoulders pinned to the mat, the slippery floor of the slaughterhouse, a trap pulled back for a mouse. The poem goes on to say that it's as if we're born for war and it for us. Another poem, Mars Ultor, presents the vision of a world in which the god of war is the first to receive a sacrifice on imperial holidays. After all, Law relies on guns or must withdraw. That is to say, where there is imperialism, war is inevitable. What other contemporary poet contemplates this kind of hard truth? Well, actually, I gotta answer that question. We just heard Martha Collins contemplate that kind of hard truth. But I sometimes think of Ernest Hilbert as a poet of empire. Who can read his poem on passing the remains of a T-62 in the Sinai without thinking of Shelley's Ozymandias? It's not that he celebrates imperialism. Hilbert recognizes, recognizes it as an act of colossal hubris, but he chooses not to look past the evidence that ours, is an imperialist nation. Here is another of his lists, this one of American battleships. Maine rests at anchor in Yokohama, Ohio in Suez, Kansas at Gibraltar. The book's title itself, Last One Out, makes one think of helicopters lifting people out of Vietnam. It is Hilbert's unflinching gaze at realities not often considered in poetry that gives his work its heft and authority. We welcome Ernest Hilbert to Virtual Newburyport. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alfred. Um, and thank you to everyone at the Newburyport Literary Festival uh, and for everyone who has uh, attended this reading. And also to everyone who stopped by uh, last night for our opening ceremony with uh, Deborah Warren, uh, which I found uh, quite uh, fun and also quite revealing. I'm going to be reading perhaps a bit more from, from the personal than the public, um, simply because that's what I usually do with this book. Uh, the book is Last One Out. It was published in 2019 by uh, Measure Press. And it's unusual among my books um, because uh, the first and final chapters of uh, a total of seven are actually quite uh, personal uh, in a way that I simply didn't 
uh, approach in the first three books. In fact, there's nothing autobiographical really at all in my first three books. Um, and so I usually begin with the first chapter, which has to do, which begins with my grandfather and then has uh, memories of my, my father and mother. And then the last chapter, which I won't jump straight to, uh, I will do against the art of war. The middle of five chapters tend to be more uh, historical and public, yes. And then the, the final chapter um, is about my, the impending arrival of my son, Ian, who was born in 2015, and then poems uh, immediately following his birth. I'm gonna begin from the uh, beginning, uh, which is the first poem in the book. It's called, Welcome to All the Pleasures. The wind was wasp and pollen, charred pork and dragonfly. My grandfather, German, with shoulders of granite, of beer and blue skies, blast furnaces, grew impatient when he learned that at four, I'd still not learned to swim. He hoisted me in summer air, spun me out over the sluggish murk and let go. I swear the river had no bottom. I smacked the sun fierce surface with a sharp cold crash, then silence and stunned slowness. I finned and swung, hung between what glows above and what pulls below. Um, this next poem is called uh, Yggdrasil, uh, which is the name of the mythical uh, tree of life that binds all the worlds together uh, in Norse mythology. And when the tree dies, everything that relied upon the, the tree begins to die as well, uh, because everything is connected. And this particular tree is a tree that uh, was in my yard uh, when I was a boy. Yggdrasil. A Bach cantata slurs to static on the stereo as a hurricane rumbles through our attic. Barrages of quicksilver rain, machine gun aluminum. Darkness drags around the lawn. By afternoon, skies foam to white. Air is washed clean. The bright grass is strewn with debris like a battle scene. We round the house to discover the chimney down, but intact, like some primitive ziggurat. We kick leaves, find a pool cover, plastic bags, limbs storm cracked, spilled out like roasted bird flesh with twists of fat. A TV aerial needles up like the mast of a wrecked schooner. Beyond it, we find the tilted apple tree. What appeared in the past so permanent is now split down the middle, pulled free from its base by the storm. Lumps of sweating soil spread where dendritic root protrudes into damp air. The tree's capillary form capsized, not entirely dead, but dying by parts where it grows. A truck and great chain will haul it from the earth. Leave a hole, will someday fill. A socket of mud, where our tree once seemed so tall. Now a den, black like a vein of coal or splash of parched ancestral blood. My father was a musician. 
um, and he taught in a public high school uh, for most of his adult life. And he was also the organist at our church. Sometimes when he was, uh, when I was uh, being watched by him, uh, uh, he would bring me with him to rehearse uh, on the organ. And so it was very peculiar being in a church at night. A church at night is a very different place um, in so many ways than what one experiences during the day when it is filled uh, during a ceremony. Um, so these, this is a memory of my father and of myself as a child. It's called recessional. My father would leave the salt encrusted Ford unlocked, the only car in the winter lot, and draw a key for the heavy church door. He'd click on a light over the organ where it glowed in black like an anglerfish at the entrance to a cavern on the ocean floor. His eyeglasses lit white from the bulb Bearded, he eased his bulk onto the bench, rifling folders of music in manuscript. The huge old organ rumbled corrals, roared enormous chords, stopping midway through a passage, consigning a long resonance from transept into the beamed vault of the nave over the stone angel that shouldered the lectern and silver vases emptied of fern and tulip. In towering stained glass, lead outlines of apostles and the ascension, lakes of green and violet, bright in morning light, rose blackened and cryptic. I explored while he scribbled notes on the sheets, at times a subtle oath or cheerful ha, while working up his Bach arrangements. In a moment of boredom before the looming pulpit, I saw that a boy as small as I could easily pass clear under the polished wooden pews. Never before would I have been so low to the floor and childlike, not at services with the adults. It felt like a discovery. I inched on my dusty belly under the cold pews, slipping from the safe gloom thrown by his light toward the deep and promising darkness. Um, this next poem is called Memorial Days, and I think uh, this one fulfills the remit of the event, which is the public and the private. And this really was when, uh, in a wrenching way, in a comic way, and possibly the two were brought together. It's called Memorial Days, and a little bit of a story to set the stage. I was visiting uh, my father's uh, grave, which is in St. Andrew's Cemetery in uh, an old town where I grew up called Mount Holly, that's in uh, southern New Jersey. And I noticed, I, I thought something was amiss. Uh, I couldn't quite figure out what it was. And I noticed that um, the little brass emblem, uh, which holds an American flag, which the local Veterans Association places there, was gone. And then I noticed it was gone from all the others as well. This is a very old uh, colonial cemetery, in fact. Uh, so there are usually ones uh, on Memorial Day, they place flags and flowers. They're going back to those who fought in the American Revolution uh, for the Grand Army of the Republic in the American Civil War, uh, for Woodrow Wilson's army in the First World War, of course, the Second World War. So I was going from person to person trying to track down. I lived in Philadelphia, but I was you know, going home and calling people trying to figure out who would put his star back. Um, you know, and they said people had been stealing them from the cemetery uh, to sell them for scrap metal. Um, so I finally got someone to say, oh yes, we'll, we'll put some new ones down and we'll have a little event for it. And I said, oh, that's fine, thank you. Uh, and it was on a Memorial Day and I uh, 
turned up. I told my family to come and I didn't think it was going to be very much. And I, uh, I thought it'd be two or three people. And I turned up and there were, you know, a hundred people and more arriving. And there were, it was a color guard with rifles and a brass band. And it seemed uh, outrageous. And then my mother walked over with a, a program. I, I was like, a program? Why is there a program? This is outrageous. And they led me over and there was a podium with a PA system at my father's uh, grave, which just seemed outrageous. I don't know what he would have thought of this. And she said, well, look, right here, it says that you'll be speaking. And I had no idea I was speaking and no one told me. So I had just a few minutes I had to come up with something to you know, try to improvise. Um, and so, you know, I did. And my, my father was only at the very end of the, uh, of the Second World War. Um, so I didn't have a lot to say. Um, but I, I managed to get through it, but it was a very emotional experience. And it's when the public came crashing down very unexpectedly and quickly into the private. So I'll, I'll read this poem, it's called Memorial Days. And also the, uh, the cemetery um, was also the site of a battle during the American Revolution, uh, the Battle of Iron Works Hill uh, between Hessians and uh, American militia, which was a delaying ash action after the Battle of Trent. So there's a, steeped with all this, you know, uh, American history and as well as my own personal history. And I was sort of put on the spot. It's called Memorial Days. The park's in bloom, its gates seeping honeysuckle. I worked to shed some flab I gained last winter. It's a year since I spoke at my father's grave before bayonets and brass bands for his memorial. 24 years of loss I had to disinter and put back again with a smile and a wave. I can hardly remember what I thought or said. My gravity's art weakens and uncoils. Eased, what was caught to my orbit drifts. I slough skin and clip nails, scrub iron pans of fat, pick up blue Doritos bags, purple soda cans in the street, some disorder obvious, some imperceptible. I keep too many books, some his, half still unread. My house, a vault piled up with pointless spoils, acquired or passed down, some stolen or gifts. What's in them? Hearts and wars, cities knocked flat. My father's marks, lists, sketches, small plans, lives that in time became impossible. Now, Alfred uh, mentioned my poem Against the Art of War, which was also issued by uh, Temporary Culture Press as a sort of beautiful, large letterpress uh, limited edition a few years ago. So I'll read it. It's not very long. It's in three sections. I won't give the numbers because you'll hear the difference. Uh, Against the Art of War. Is it merely the making and ending of states that justifies ceaseless sending of youthful armies each generation to patrol and maintain uneasy peace, sustain alliance with our latest creation? War begins and builds in all things. With fears and fantasies, it grows and brings new goals and assurance of gain. We rear it, we claim it, for our own and name it the myth of Hercules, the mark of Cain. It waits all summer in the young wasp's tail on a tetanus bristling nail, abrasion of nipple against new worn cloth, flutter of kamikaze moth, the ache and doubt of a 38 hour birth, the glare of sunlight scorching earth, the crouch and pounce of household cat the loser's shoulders pinned to mat, the slippery floor of the slaughterhouse, a trap pulled back for a mouse. It's there in landslide and lightning storm 
and viral phlegms infectious swarm. Is life not filled enough with things like war? The prodigal genius of humankind confers renewed glamour upon conflict and forever grants reason to summon it, finds solace in unfilled promises of power, invention that leads to loss, as if we're born for war and in it for us. A beast we breed for force that champs the bit, that smiles and knows we cannot control it. Um, I'm looking at the time. I will do um, some poems from the last section of the book. Um, this one is called Super Bowl Sunday. Um, my son Ian, uh, that first Super Bowl must have been only two months old or so, three months. And if you remember, if you've had children, you won't remember this uh, from your own childhood, but we don't know how to use our body yet. <laughs> Everything's flopping around, we're helpless. We don't know how to use our mouths yet. We drool, uh, we can't really form things with it, but he, he imitated us and he would imitate our smiles because we were so happy and are. And he, I was sitting there with him. It was Super Bowl Sunday, I remember, and it was cold and the sun was going down and I was watching him um, and he would try to smile uh, and he got this little smile, but the muscles weren't strong enough to hold it very long. But it was his first smile. It was his very first smile. And he smiles a lot. He's good at it. Uh, this is a poem called Super Bowl Sunday. And this is very much a, an intersection, if you will, of the public and the private, at least uh, in its meditative quality. Super Bowl Sunday. On the blue couch, the brown tabby cat curls content as a dragon on its hoard. He claws lazily at a drift of junk mail, then lolls back on a lopsided pillow. Beside him, I hold you, not yet one, my son, swaddled in butterflies. You stretch, cheap like a finch, burble and plop open your wet mouth like a koi lapping at a leaf on a lake. Squirrels skitter and startle each other outside. You squirm on my lap this late sunny Saturday in a cold month. This is enough. We abide. I'm reading a wife's memoir of her husband, a poet as sentimental as I, as foolish and as easily made up of failures, sometimes as stupidly happy. Don Giovanni roars, cast down into the depths of the black stereo. Soon the great game will commence. Towering champions created to win will strut to their positions and pose, burnished, armored in emblems. Lenses will zag and pan as the colors crash and tumble all in a triumphal heap. Already the light is leaving and windows brighten across the street. In the edging dark, unsure, you imitate my smile in miniature. You're first, not long held, but you will try again. The world is deep with unwon battles, merciless and uncertain as our memories. I rise, cradling you, my son, carefully like a football in one arm as you yawn. Grope with my free hand for the switch. Your aquatic eyes give back the last of the light. And a moment, I myself seem slight 
and alive, restless and agile. The reckless lengths I ran so long ago, no longer gone. So long ago, that day, when, like you, in lightning and rivers, I began. In order to keep us under the wire here, because we've been warned we have to end exactly on time, I'm going to wrap up with just one more short poem. This one's called Lesser Feasts. Um, and it's about that strange time after, after this, um, the solstice, um, you know, it's the winter solstice. It's, it's still very dark and very cold and it's getting colder, but we, we be, do begin to feel that we're getting slightly more light, as dark as it is, that something is coming. The relief of spring is on the way. Um, my son was born on the 15th, I'm sorry, the 12th of December. <laughs> Good thing my wife isn't watching. Uh, the 12th of December. Um, so it's right around that time um, when it's happening, just before Christmas. So it's called Lesser Feasts, and this one's for Ian. The house is cold today. A deep rooted fortress. Foundation blocks of Wissahickon schist. Mica sparkling in late December sun. A hull becalmed between two storms. Iced recess and an expectant clearness between mist and sleet, as if a brief peace had been won. For soup, I rend the Christmas turkey carcass, yank slick, sturdy strands apart. Though some resist my hands, as jellied fat, warmed, begins to run. The hard world yields little we may possess. Our newborn opens and fastens his fist. Happy, we sort a small steading for our son. Years end and lights begun to dispossess the exhausted dark. I trace his small wrist. May life, like light, be strong before it's done. Thank you. Thank you, my friend Ernest Hilbert, for your extraordinary poetry and for everything you've brought to, to this year's literary festival. And thanks again to you, Martha Collins, newly met, for your poignant, powerful reading. Stay well, both of you, and keep doing the important work you're doing. <laughs>